So Einstein's your biggest buddy, right? And you're thinking 1905. Dang, 1905, you're sitting there working as a Swiss patent clerk, and you're gonna go ahead and publish something called special relativity? And that's already enough, right? But not only was he publishing a paper on special relativity, that paper was also, I mean, it was the second paper they published at the same time, and that was on the photoelectric effect. So he explained the previous video, how quantum explanations of light can explain why, eh, you know, all that stuff that we did in the previous video about the photoelectric effect. In fact, wow, this is terrible. E F F E C T. Okay, so all that's great, but we've been talking about the energy of light, where it's H times the frequency, and I've been writing in green for Washington University. Let's go to seafoam green. No, that doesn't really work. Let's go to red because it's the other color of Washington University. They want to be known as Washington University in St. Louis, or Woostel, but everybody around here calls them WashU. And WashU is pretty awesome for several reasons, but one of the reasons WashU is awesome is that in 1921 or two or something, maybe it was even 1923, WashU hired Compton. His name was Arthur Holly Compton. He had a brother too, don't confuse them. We're talking about A.H. Compton. And I'm talking about when he was hired, he had been working in England and on the boat to the United States. See, on the boat to the United States, they didn't have Wi-Fi, so his iPod was essentially useless to do any surfing and his iPad and his iPhone. It was all just sitting there in a wooden crate. But Compton had some time to think and on a napkin with the boat thing here, it was like a, a picture of the boat and it had some boat stuff on it. And uh, it was a napkin from the boat that he was taking from England to the United States. He sketched out this beautiful experiment. He said, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do my effect. And they named it the Compton Effect because that was what Compton wanted to call it. Compton was an incredible man, and I've actually seen and sat in a room with many times his death mask. So he's sitting there, you know, dead and all, and um, you can see his bronze death mask if you go to Washu. So go to Washu, see his death mask, sit in front of it, and think about how that feels. He died in 1962, but in the meantime, he was working in the hall that's kind of right up the center from the quad, and he was working in the basement. He was working so hard to set up this Compton effect that his wife would come in and bring him dinner through the basement windows and he wouldn't even leave the basement. He was there all day and all night for a very long time. I don't know, a year or two. And that's cool because he won the Nobel Prize for this work. It was a fantastic idea that he had on a boat, sketched it out, made it happen. That's how you do science. So in 1923, this experiment was performed and the idea is this. He had an electron sitting here. Don't ask me how he got an electron, but it is supposed to be a free electron just sitting there. Probably it was on something or in something. And then there's this wave particle thing. Well, he sent light at it, and he sent light in the form of x-rays at it. So here's an x-ray going towards an electron. And what's about to happen is the x-ray is going to hit the electron and the x-ray will come out like here. Let me give you a dotted line right here. There's going to be a collision and I'm going to define my axes to be like this. I'm going to say that way is the x-axis and this way is the y-axis. And what's about to happen is that x-ray will bounce off of the electron and it will be like this now. And the reason I've stretched out my little wave packet a little bit, oh, it's gonna hit Compton's death mask, oh no, it goes that direction. The reason I've stretched it out just a little bit in wavelength is because the wavelength will change. So I'll say that this is the initial wavelength over here and I'll say that this is the after collision wavelength. I'm treating, look, I'm going so quantum with this light ray that I'm saying I can send a single photon in and like a billiard ball, it will bounce off of the electron. Now what's that electron gonna do if the photon's coming in even and going out up a little bit, you can bet that that electron is gonna go down a little bit. Let's show the electron's eventual path like this. And well, let's continue this dotted line here and define some angles. I'm gonna say that angle right there we could call theta and I'm gonna call this angle right here, which way did the electron go? And I don't want to tell you why, but we can't tell where that electron ends up going. 
it has some momentum afterwards. That's the momentum of the electron, and I don't have to put a prime on it because the electron's momentum afterwards is the only momentum the electron ever had. It starts with no momentum at all. It's just a free electron sitting there. And the photon comes out with some momentum. Oh, do, does light have momentum? Is that even possible? Yeah, I guess it does. Its momentum is h divided by lambda. So this is the initial momentum of the photon coming in. And afterwards, if we're looking at momentum conservation, I guess I'm thinking about momentum conservation. Let's get ourselves a little bit more room. If I'm thinking about momentum conservation, I can conserve momentum. Sorry, this is kind of loud. I can conserve momentum in the x direction, and I can conserve momentum in the y direction, and I probably need to do both of those. I need to conserve momentum in the x direction and in the y direction. So I'm gonna say p in the x direction, and I'm gonna get this equation. It looks to me like the momentum over here is going to be h divided by lambda, and that is the initial momentum in the x direction. Afterwards, I'm gonna have this funny thing here. I've got this angle, and I've got, I know the angle, because I can see where the electron, uh, sorry, I can see where the photon ends up afterwards. X-rays have this cool thing where they interact with film and you can see where they hit stuff. It's called X-rays. Oh, that's a great idea to call it what it is. Super. So I'm gonna say that after the collision, we've got H over lambda prime, right? Because that's the momentum of this guy, but it's not totally that in the x direction. That's this component right here, which is h over lambda prime, if I'm talking about momentum in the x direction of the photon after collision. Wait a second. Do you realize what I just said? I said that this particle of light hits an electron and changes color. See the wavelength? has changed, which means the frequency has changed, which means this is not the same color light as it came in. Wow, it came out with a different color from what it came in with. So I'm gonna say H over lambda prime right here, but I need to find this part right here, and it looks like to me that's gonna be the cosine of theta, that's the X component right here. So I've got H over lambda prime cosine theta. Now that's the conservation of momentum in the X direction considering only the photon. Remember our electron, just got some momentum also. So it's going to be plus the momentum of the electron, but then I need to multiply the uh, <clears throat> magnitude of the momentum of the electron times the cosine of phi, dot, 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 right there. We could do that, but I think that will just mess things up. So I'm gonna say cosine of phi. And then momentum conservation in the y direction is a little bit simpler because, oh, sorry, colon, I'm gonna show you the momentum conservation in the y direction. What is the momentum in the y direction of the initial situation, this photon coming in? Nothing at all. And then it's going to be equal to, well, the momentum in the y direction of this guy is simply, well, it's gonna be h over lambda prime times the sine, I guess? times the sine of theta, and then I have to subtract because see, my electron has negative momentum the way I've set it up. Of course, all of these will reverse really evenly. It doesn't matter if your photon goes up or down, whatever. And then I'm going to subtract the momentum of the electron after the collision times the sine of phi. Okay, some cool symmetry between those two equations. Also, energy must be conserved. So we got momentum conservation in x and in y. Momentum conservation is very, very strict because we have to have it in all dimensions. In z, we don't have any momentum ever. We've set this up so it's in the xy plane. That was smart, right? Good idea. Yes. Oh, good. Okay, so now we also have energy conservation, and the energy that is initially coming in is h times frequency. But what if you don't like h times frequency? What if you want to be completely in wavelength? And I kind of want to also. You remember that speed is frequency times wavelength. So if I want to find out what frequency is, well, it's going to be c over lambda. So check this out. This is hf, but it's going to be also, oh man, h, hc over lambda. That's the initial energy of this incoming x-ray, and the final energy of the outgoing x-ray, it doesn't have components, so I'm just gonna add on the energies, right? It's going to be hc over lambda prime, and then I have to add in the energy of this electron, right? Ooh, the energy of the electron, what are you gonna say, that that's kinetic energy of the electron? Yeah, it is the kinetic energy of the electron, but how does kinetic energy relate 
to momentum. Let's see if it could be p squared over 2m. Let's see. Momentum is m times v, so this is m squared v squared, and if I divide it by 2 times m, then my m's are going to cancel right there. I get 1 half m v squared. Oh, so kinetic energy is p squared over 2m. So I'm going to say this is plus the momentum of the electron squared divided by 2 times the mass of the electron. So the mass of the electron plays into my calculation, that's a little bit interesting, and the speed of light plays into my calculation. What we've got here is we've got three equations, clearly, and we have three unknowns. Let me list for you the things that we don't know. Well, we know h already, right? We know the speed of light, and we know the incoming, ooh, we know the incoming wavelength of the x-ray, but we don't know the outgoing wavelength of the x-ray. And the other thing that we don't know is the angle at which this electron left. And the final thing that we don't know is the velocity of the outgoing electron. So we want, I guess it might be interesting to completely solve this equation, to get things like the final wavelength of our photon that came in, and we might also want the, uh, well, you could talk about the momentum or the energy or just the velocity of the electron, and we also might want to know which way that electron seems to be going. So we could want all of those things. The coolest thing to do is to combine all these equations and solve for the shift in wavelength. And that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this sheet away right now, I'm going to tell you that the shift in wavelength this is how much the wavelength of, the, like, this is like a color change. There's color changing here. That's going to be, I'm going to say that it's the final wavelength minus the initial wavelength, and that turns out to be h over the mass of the electron times c times 1 minus the cosine of theta. So this shift in in wavelength, sorry, the shift in wavelength depends on the angle at which, um, <clears throat> at which the photon comes out. Does that make sense? If I have a maximal shift right here, wait a second, the cosine, mm, 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 okay. So if the cosine is zero, then that means that the photon has not been deflected. If theta equals zero, then cosine theta equals one, which means I have one minus one, which means that there is no shift. So delta lambda is zero. Okay, so that means, <laughs> <laughs> it means your x-ray missed your electron, tough guy. Try again. What if theta is 180 degrees? Ooh, then cosine of theta is negative 1. So delta lambda is, well, I'm going to have 1 minus negative 1. Delta lambda is going to be 2 times h divided by the mass of the electron times c. So this is the maximal shift in the wavelength. It doesn't mean that the wavelength is going to go to zero or something. It means that that's the most it can possibly shift by twice its initial momentum, right? Because we know, oh gosh, divided by m. Interesting, very interesting. I want you to play around with this, see if you can do the derivation that is required from right here. My students are required to do this combination of equations, so I'm not going to put it on the internet. They can find it other places if they're astute, but really that sort of spoils the fun of it if you're just finding somebody else's derivation and writing it down. Good luck. Compton effect, pretty awesome. Props to Wash U. What? What?